Hello, I'm Joshua Sparrow at the Brazelton Touchpoint Center, and this is Learning to Listen, Conversations for Change. To find out more about the Brazelton Touchpoint Center and Learning to Listen, just go to braseltontouchpoints.org and click on the Offerings tab or the Webinars tab. Today, we will be listening to psychologist, Columbia University professor, and New Yorker and New York Times contributor, Andrew Solomon, who has been pondering how COVID has challenged and changed families, listening to all kinds of families and asking, who rocks the cradle now? The title of his forthcoming book. Dr. Solomon observes that the nature of family has changed and is changing profoundly and proposes that we cheat ourselves when we fail to recognize and celebrate that burgeoning diversity. He has met with single parents, divorced parents, foster parents, parents who used assisted reproductive technology, same-sex parents, multi-parent families, and many others who are inventing new structures from which we all stand to learn. His work has also deepened profoundly his experience as a husband and father. We are incredibly fortunate to have Andrew Solomon join us today, and you'll soon see why if you don't know already. But first, a bit of information about today's Learning to Listen episode. Over 1,200 people have registered for today's webinar. It's great to see you all in the chat. So tell us who you are and where you're from and what you do there. Our superb interpreter, Natalia Correa, joining us from Bogota, Colombia, will be simultaneously translating our webinar in Spanish. Thank you, Natalia. To access the translation, click on the interpretation icon in your Zoom controls, then select Spanish. To mute the English in the background, select mute original audio. La conversación de hoy será en español y inglés. En los controles de esta reunión, haga clic en interpretación. Haga clic en el idioma que le gustaría escuchar. Para escuchar solo español, haga clic en silenciar audio original. We are also providing closed captions today for those who would like to use them. To turn captioning on, please click on the closed caption icon in your Zoom controls and select show subtitle. You can adjust the size for the subtitles. Please use the chat feature if you have a comment to share or need help with a technical issue. Please do put your questions for Andrew Solomon in the question and answer box, and we will try to pause a few times along the way to respond to them. If you would like to receive a certificate of attendance for today's webinar, please do be sure you complete the feedback survey. The survey will open in your web browser when this webinar ends, and you'll also receive a link to the survey tomorrow in a thank you email that will include a link to the webinar recording too. Both the survey and webinar recording will be available in both English and Spanish. And you can also access recordings on our YouTube channel and our website. Before we begin, I want to thank our sponsor, the Burke Foundation, and our Brazilton Touchpoint Center production team, Isabella Mantella, uh, Shella Merchant-Juma, Michael Accardi, Kim Netter, and Suzanne Okasik. And now I'd like to introduce today's guest, Andrew Solomon. Dr. Solomon is a professor of clinical psychology at Columbia University Medical Center, lecturer in psychology at Yale University, and past president of Penn American Center, a nonprofit that defends and celebrates free expression in the United States and worldwide. Andrew Solomon is a writer and lecturer on psychology, politics, and the arts, and an activist in LGBTQ rights, mental health, and the arts, and contributes regularly to the New Yorker and the New York Times. In fact, his piece on child suicide just came out in last week's New Yorker and is not to be missed. In Andrew Solomon's 2012 book, Far From the Tree, Parents, Children, and the Search for Identity, uh, he won the National Books uh, Critics Circle Award for nonfiction, and that book was chosen as one of the New York Times 10 best books of 2012. His subsequent book, Far and Away, How Travel Can Change the World, was published in 2016 and has been named a New York Times notable book. 
He previously wrote The Noonday Demon and Atlas of Depression, which won the 2001 National Book Award and was a finalist for the 2002 Pulitzer Prize. More recently, he made an award-winning film of Far From the Tree available on Hulu, and uh, it's well worth watching. I had the uh, privilege of going to see uh, the premiere in New York before the pandemic. And uh, he also more recently has done an audio book called New Family Values, which touches on some of the topics and themes we'll be uh, talking about today. Andrew lives with his husband and son in New York and London and is a dual national. He also has a daughter with a college friend. Andrew Solomon, thank you so much for joining us today. It is so great to see you again. And I only wish it could once again be in person. Well, I'm delighted to be here and I hope that it will be in person soon. <laughs> Me too. So when, when you and I last did meet in person, you were already working on a new book and listening to families. And in the manus manuscript for that forthcoming book, which you're calling Who Rocks the Cradle, uh, you explain, and I, I'll read an excerpt here. I am the biological father of George, who is 10 right now. My husband, John, is his adoptive father and through his early childhood was his primary caretaker. We have no contact at present with the egg donor who is his genetic mother, but she agreed ahead of insemination that she would be willing to meet George when he is 18, if he so wishes. We are very close to our surrogate, Lara, whom George calls Mama, but who lives in another state and whom we see only intermittently. He calls Lara's wife, Tammy, Mommy, and he calls their children, Oliver and Lucy, of whom my husband is the biological father, his brother and sister. So tell us about you and your family and how uh, expanding our understanding of who rocks the cradle became your passion and your commitment. The purpose of that passage really was to leave people slightly confused. So if you're <laughs> slightly confused, then um, it worked. The point is to say that families have become immensely complex and we tend to measure the value of any kind of family by the extent to which it conforms to the 1950s ideal of family um, that was uh, never really the way families were even in the 1950s. But we imagine a heterosexual, um, uh, uh, uniracial uh, married couple in which one person is the primary breadwinner and another person is the primary caretaker um, and they have a certain limited number of children. And what interested me as I began on Who Rocks the Cradle was uh, to look at all the different things that constitute family today, to look at divorce and step families and the way that the women's movement um, really allowed women the freedom to leave marriages in which they were unhappy, to look at interracial uh, marriages and to look at the way that Loving v. Virginia in legalizing interracial marriage um, was really the first time that people said, it is not up to the government to say whom we can marry, it is up to us and then to look in sequence at um, a variety of other kinds of family, at um, uh, assisted reproduction, at single parenthood, at adoption, at foster care, at um, LGBTQ families, at multi-parent families, um, at paid child care, and at the so-called child-free family. And in terms of my own family, I mean, you've given the rundown of how we are all related to one another, but I had grown up with the sense that a family that didn't conform to those um, old ideals, to which my family that I grew up in, my family of origin actually did conform, was somehow to be pitied. Um, it's hard to believe I'm 58 now, and when I was a kid, there was one kid in my class who had divorced parents, and everyone considered it um, a, you know, a sort of tragedy and felt terribly sorry for him and so on and so forth. And um, that was just divorce. And I feel like now we have these many, many forms of family and it's been the proliferation of many kinds of family that's made it possible for me to have a family and that's made it possible for us to have the complexities that you narrated at the beginning of this uh, section. Reading from your um, fabulous manuscript. And, and here's another excerpt from it um, to, um, again, um, listen to you and how you came to um, be uh, passionate and committed to um, helping us all think differently and freshly about families. You write, 
I remember when I was younger and people said, you could be gay and still have a child. At the time I thought, and it may have been partly just internalized homophobia, that being a gay parent was unfair, that it would be too hard on the child to have gay parents. So painful to read that. Then you go on, a lot of other gay people did it. And then I thought, okay, now it's a social norm. And it feels to me like I can do it and it won't be that hard on my putative children. So um, set the stage for us. Um, tell us more about what families looked like when you were growing up and it was what it was like for you growing up in those kinds of families and what forces since then have been driving changing family structures. You've talked a little bit about um, uh, the, the, um, the legislation in Virginia with regard to of undoing the terrible old laws on quote unquote miscegenesis. But tell us about what's been driving these changes to family structures. And, and also, you know, over these past two years, uh, how are you seeing the pandemic uh, change the ways in which family structures, roles and relationships are unfolding? Um, well, I feel like there has been this vast opening of what constitutes family and that the error we've made, which you alluded to earlier, is that we have tended to judge all these kinds of families by the extent of their similarity to that 50s ideal. And that actually diversity is richness of experience. I think the current movement toward racial justice is predicated on that idea. There isn't one set of uh, behaviors that's right and everything else is wrong and marginal. There are different ways to be and to interact in the world. And what I'm interested in, in undertaking this project is how we can come to value that diversity unto itself and stop saying, okay, you're gay parents, but it's really not that different from straight parents and you're really doing the same thing. And instead say, actually, my children are having different experiences from the experiences of many of their classmates because they've grown up in a household with someone who is gay as, or uh, for George, two people who are gay as their parents. And uh, what are the ways that we can understand and learn from that difference of experience rather than trying to erase it? I think often in the quest, the valid quest for a rhetoric of equality, we have engaged in a false rhetoric of equivalence. And I want to get away from that equivalence um, and back toward the equality in which we can uh, pay respect to every kind of family and recognize the profundity of their uh, existence. Um, so far as the pandemic goes, the pandemic has had two simultaneous and troubling effects. One has been to, um, uh, isolate people so that people for long periods of lockdown uh, were uh, cut off from the rest of the world. And certainly for my children, makes me realize how long ago I wrote the passage you wrote, George is now 13, I think he was 10 in what you read. Mm -hmm. My children was a long period of not really seeing anybody else um, and of um, being cut off. Um, so that results in a sense of isolation and it has adverse effects on development. Development consists not only of doing your homework, but also of interacting with your peers and achieving greater maturity as you understand better how those interactions work. But at the same time that the pandemic engendered that sense of isolation, um, it has also um, brought about an extreme intimacy. Um, if you were sheltering with your family, then there were three or six or two or nine, if you, however many it was, who were probably living in a house and spending all of your time together and spending all of your time together often is very difficult for people and uh, mostly people were sheltering with their families and their families became their whole reality. I think that the experience in this instance of being um, isolated with your family was kind of the same no matter what kind of family you had. If you don't have to keep explaining your family, then it, it isn't as different as it is if you do. And I realized that I went through a long period in which no one ever said to me, um, so wait a minute, how are you all related? And in which no one said, oh, so you're both his fathers or any of those other things that people- like, said, And his mother or something. something. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Right. Um, so, so that's the structure of that. So that, that reminds me of another passage uh, in the book that um, I hoped that we would get to. Um, and uh, I hope it's okay to read it. You quote Joan Laird, who reviewed um, 
all of the research and, and you quote her as saying a generation of research has failed to demonstrate that gays or lesbians are any less fit to parent than their heterosexual counterparts. Parts. Furthermore, a substantial number of studies on the psychological and social development of children of lesbian and gay parents have failed to produce any evidence that children of lesbian or gay parents are harmed or compromised or even differ from in any significant ways along a host of psychosocial developmental measures children raised in heterosexual families. And this is one of the things I, I, I love about you and your writing and your thinking is you're, you're, you know, you always sort of go right to where the complexities and the challenges and the conflicts are and you go on to say they will the children of lesbian or gay parents, they will, however, face three problems. First, their parents will have confronted stigma and may be traumatized by that experience, and that trauma may carry forward to their parenting. Second, these children may feel excluded from the mainstream, in the case of interracial children, from the mainstreams associated with each of their constituent race groups. Third, they are champions of an unsought complexity to which they may feel unequal. The question is whether we solve these problems by preventing such parents from having children or whether we instead try to improve our society to the point where none of these prejudices is operative. The more variant families there are, however, the easier the experience of such families become. The proliferation, and this goes back to what I read earlier in your writing, the proliferation of gay families made it easier for me to have one and made it easier for my kids to be part of one. But the kids did not ask to be avatars of revolution. Social reform is a steep burden to place on the shoulders of children. So I, I hope it's okay if I ask you, you know, because you, you just go straight to that challenge that's on your shoulders too, um, how, how you're carrying that and how, you're, you're, how George is carrying that, your son. Um, well, my son and my daughter Blaine as well are mm -hmm. both carrying it in, um, in their ways. Um, I was working on something for which I had to interview a number of parents in my son's class. And we got onto the subject of uh, his experiences at school. And one of the mothers said, well, she said, I mean, he seems to have dealt with that horrible episode on the play deck, but I was really surprised. And I didn't at the time want to say what horrible episode on the play deck, because I thought it would sound like I didn't know what was going on with my child. And I mm -hmm. thought I would just ask George. So he came home and I said, there was apparently a horrible episode on the play deck a little while ago. Can you tell me what happened? And he said, oh, I don't, I don't really know what you're talking about. I didn't think anything horrible has happened. So then I was speaking to another St. Bernard's parent who said, um, you know, did George have a rough time with that horrible thing on the play deck? This went on and I kept, and they, I then started saying to people, I dropped my pride and I said, what was the horrible episode on the play deck? And people said, well, I mean, he used that word and he knew just who he was talking to. And I said, what word? And they said, uh, just just something he shouldn't have nobody wanted to tell me and finally <clears throat> my husband said to George did um this particular child call you a faggot on the play deck because that was the term that was um, bandied about in my husband's childhood and in my childhood as an insult and it seemed like that was the only one we could think of that could possibly be so impossible for these other parents to say to us and George said oh yeah yeah, he did. That that happened. We finally got the story there. But I thought, okay, he didn't tell us about that, even when asked about it, mm -hmm. because I think he was aware that that was a slur that had been used hurtfully against us. It's not so pertinent to him. He appears to be um, outlandishly heterosexual himself. Um, and uh, uh, And so I don't know how hurtful it was to him to hear that uh, that word used, but, you know, it's different. I mean, if one of the other kids had been called a faggot, it would have been just about the kid. When George was called a faggot, it was about not only the kid, but also his parents, and it was about the context that he came from. And I think that that can be a, a locus of great richness for him, um, but I think it's up to us as his parents 
to help construct it, to construct the richness, to construct the self-image, to construct the fact of being a child of gay parents, um, and to get used to what happens to us over and over again. You know, we went to Canada a while ago, and we were asked at the um, airport, where is the child's mother? And I said, the child doesn't have a mother. He has two fathers. Here we both are. And the woman said, every child has a mother. Where is the mother? And this was Canada. I mean, we've traveled to a lot of much more difficult places. We went through a whole rigmarole. We've just come back from a trip to Saudi Arabia. There, perhaps less surprisingly, we ran into the same thing. I carry his birth certificate with me whenever we travel so that we can prove our validity as a family. There's still a lot of fighting to be done. And while I wish I could do all of it and leave none of it to my children, I know that they have to be engaged in that fight as well. And what I can do is try to not only question them, but also to ask them about how they've been called in and to ask them how they feel about it and to try to be responsive to their answers. There's a comment in the chat um, saying that George may have been feeling protective of his dad and didn't want to say anything. And you also talked about um, the potential for richness. So I'm wondering if you could comment on both sides. Well, I think George certainly did want to protect us and that that was why he hadn't been terribly forthcoming uh, about it. Um, I also think it wasn't so hugely traumatic for him as some of the other parents seemed to think it would have been. But um, uh, I think we, I mean, there are parents whose parenthood is more specifically oriented around um, the issue of their sexuality. You know, there are parents who um, live in a world that consists mostly of gay parents and who go to Gay Family Week in um, uh, Provincetown every year, which is a fantastic institution, Gay Family Week. We went once. Um, it's it, There are some people for whom it's more defining in their day-to-day -day life than it is for us, um, we have quite a range of friends. We live in New York City where there isn't any sense that you have to isolate within one community rather than another. We have friends who are gay parents. George has friends who have gay parents, but mostly he's friends with the kids in his school. And there's only one other kid in his class who has gay parents and they're not particularly close. So um, the question all the way through uh, is the one of what what is it that we have to give as parents? And part of what we have to give as parents is that we lived with secrets and we lived with lies and we lived with a great deal of internal pain. And I think it's made me somewhat better at recognizing and responding to those qualities in my own children and I hope in, um, in the world at large. Um, and so I hope that the the difficulty that I went through informs my parenting. Many kinds of difficulty inform many kinds of parenting. I don't wanna say this is only true of gay families and we're the most special in the world and everyone should have a gay family. I feel like any structure can work and any structure can fail. And the question is to see how one structure works and then how another one works and how another one works and to look also at how they fail or fall apart. You know, you, you um... Again, to go back to richness in what you just said, uh, one, of, one of the wonderful things about you and your work is the way, I think your experience with depression as well as knowing you were gay very young in a world that would not have it, um, has really taught you how to take pain. You know, take pain and figure like where, where where does that not that you would wish it on anybody but where does it make you strong um there's this little comment in the manuscript uh talking uh, with someone about their own struggle with suicide it might have been a child and you you have this sort of wry comment in parentheses about this is when it helps to have you know had a thought or two about suicide mm -hmm. and um i i i I pick up on this because I, I think there are many of us who are concerned that the, the pressure on parents to be perfect and to and being perfect means having uh, kids who are first and foremost happy ends up fragilizing um, children. Whereas when you think about, well, well, George will have some of these adverse experiences, but there is some richness there that I think of as maybe in part um, coming or you're being able to see that from your own experience of being in really overwhelming pain and suffering 
and then figuring out um, where the strengths are. I don't know if that's fair to say or how you would restate it better. Well, I would say that you've touched on the kind of central issue of my work. My first book was about a group of Soviet artists and how their lives changed during Glasnost. Um, I then wrote a novel that was loosely based on my mother's illness and death. I then wrote a book about depression, then a book about parenting children with disabilities. They seem like very different subjects, but actually they're all kind of the same subject, which is how can you take what you're given, which is always imperfect, and try to draw strength from the things that are wrong in it um, and try to um, achieve dignity in relation to it. And I found that very, uh, I mean, very central to my own life experience. How can I build something of worth out of um, experiences of great um, sorrow and pain and I found when I was writing about depression that the people who said, I experienced that, but I'm gonna wall it off and compartmentalize it and never think about it again, are oddly the ones who are in fact most haunted by it. And the people who integrate the experience of depression into a life narrative in which it makes sense are the ones who are prepared in case depression comes knocking at their door again to endure it as depression generally does come knocking again it's a cyclical condition um, sometimes arrested by appropriate treatment um, so what were the ways that um, uh, the people who acknowledged the difficulty actually came through and in a way i guess this book is the same question do you say we're a gay family and just like everyone else, or we're an interracial family and there's no difference or any of the other things that might be in it. Or do you say, um, these are the experiences our family has, look at all we can learn from them. That's not to say that you would have elected um, uh, to, um, to have those particular learning processes, but those learning processes can be valuable and can ultimately become, uh, not in dealing with depression, but in dealing with this diversity of family forms that I'm now writing about somewhat more cheerfully. But, uh, you know, they can ultimately um, produce children who are engaged with the world in a different way than children who never experience the slings and arrows of prejudice and um, uh, diminution. You know, the, what, you, what you said about the burden of carrying secrets or of walling off rather than integrating reminds me of another passage that I thought was so important um, in, in this manuscript. You write, many gay people didn't get to be adolescent in adolescence when they were occupied with repression or shame. And so even gay people who have children in middle age are having children young. We are in a different location on the spectrum of development. That, that seemed like such an important observation and another part of the bearing of secrets and the walling off and the costs. And I suppose also of the joy that I feel, you know, in, in the pages you've written about this kind of validation and affirmation of, of um, inventing families and making the families, um, uh, that um, you and your loved ones are in. Um, we, we had a, a couple of questions and um, one was, um, I think also related to this issue of walling off not integrated se um, secrets. The children of families with visible difference certainly do carry a burden. What are your thoughts on when, if a child of family that passes the white picket fence test should be told of their more unusual origins, um, such as the use of a donor or of a parent's um, transgender identity? I mean, the general wisdom to which I tend to subscribe is that it's easiest for children not to have a big reveal when they're um, more grown up, and that it's easiest if you say to them from the very beginning, um, you were adopted, and this is what that means, or you say, well, I am your mommy, but sometimes, you know, your mommy needs to get help from another um, woman in order to be able to have a child, and this is someone who helped me. There are sort of um, various children's books that deal with these issues explicitly and directly. And I think the thing that's often very traumatizing for people is to feel like, oh, 
there's a really basic thing about me that you didn't tell me until now. And I'm 15 years old and I never knew that there was an egg donor. And now I know that. And so what else didn't I know? And what else did everyone around me, or at least my parents around me, have in their minds that was pertinent to me that they didn't tell us? Um, and so I think waiting for a long time is often traumatic and starting very early with that information um, it tends to be better. That said, it depends a little bit on the social values of the community that one is in. There are plenty of people in the white picket fence world who are uncomfortable with um, uh, families that are different in any way, certainly with your having a transgender parent, for example. And you have to be prepared if you share the information with a very young child for the fact that very young children are not particularly discreet and they tend to share whatever information they have. So. Um, but it brings back to my mind when I was writing about the difference between visible and invisible disabilities in Far From the Tree. I think in most people think, well, it's better to be able to pass as not having any disabilities. But actually, I ultimately came to think it's harder. If you have no leg, then nobody expects you to walk. But if you have autism, especially if you have not very severe autism, people expect you to function uh, by the same rules as the mainstream. And often that's something that you don't want to do, perhaps, or that you can't do, or that doesn't make sense to you. And so it's not what you do. And people then think, what on earth? Why are you being so weird? What is going on here? And so on and so forth. And so I think what's important is for people to um, to recognize that uh, that keeping secrets occupies an enormous amount of energy, keeping secrets within your family, keeping secrets within your community, and that by and large, though not all the time, if you don't put all that energy into keeping secrets, you can put it into expanding people's worldview in such a way that your family structure becomes an acceptable one. As I say, there are communities where having a transgender parent would be very difficult to um, communicate to um, rural communities in some parts of the country. But, um, but essentially, um, essentially, I think that um, the energy spent on keeping secrets is energy badly used. And I say that as someone who was really closeted until my early 20s, and I feel I expended an enormous amount of energy that could have gone to happiness and love um, on secrecy and um, uh, uh, closeness. I have to say in your writing though, there's a way in which you relish the love now um, and share it, um, <laughs> which is just really a delight. They're such a delight. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. And I'm sure I'll, I'll, when, when this book comes out, there will be many who'll be grateful. There are lots of comments in the chat uh, uh, that I, I wanted to share with you uh, to, you know, so that you can get a sense of how this is resonating. Um, there's one, uh, I grew up with a severely disabled father and 58 years old, and it always frustrated, angered me that most people seemed surprised that I loved him and wanted to include him and considered him a good father. For most people, teachers, friends, even extended family, he was a non-entity. And uh, there, there's another um, one. I'm a parent of, of three children that my husband and I adopted and I have a disability. Another, my daughter is five and has two half sisters. We only call them her sisters. She doesn't even know what half means. Gets a little bit young for fractions. In her short time on this earth, she has had multiple people try and tell her her sisters are only her stepsisters, half sisters. When she talks about having sisters, um, much harder to have an invisible disability. My daughter's managed dyslexia for years and has introduced many challenges for academically. So, so uh, lots of uh, resonance there. And, and I guess that, that suggests that maybe we might talk a little bit more about challenges for families that are inventing themselves within their families themselves, as well as in their surroundings. Uh, both, you know, at the level of neighborhoods and schools, as well as um, at the state and national politics and policy level, and 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 not to stay on the sort of downer side of it. What what are the benefits and gifts that we've also um, begun to touch upon for um, families that are inventing themselves, as you put it? Well, 
I don't want to suggest that everyone has to go public in a big way and become an activist. Some people are interested in doing that. Some people aren't interested in doing that. And some children will say, can you please not tell anyone that thing you just told me? And some children will say, oh, I guess I can just tell everyone and they'll happily go out and share with, um, with everyone. Um, so, I mean, there are many, many different approaches and, you know, different approaches. I realized that what I said last, uh, in answer to the last question sounded somewhat prescriptive. And in fact, many different approaches can work and there are many different um, approaches that people undertake. Um, I think that the, uh, the ultimate uh, message for all of the people who talk about things like having a disabled father, one of my closest friends had a father who went blind. Um, and um, this friend described to me going with her father to negotiate a bank loan and the bank officer wouldn't talk to her father. He kept turning his head to talk to her instead. Um, that's the kind of thing um, growing up in that circumstance that requires you know, a lot of um, insight from the child's part to understand what it means to see a parent being effectively erased. I mean, one of the many hats I wear is a kind of disability rights hat. I only have, only, I have depression. I don't have other uh, major disabilities um, uh, so far as I'm aware, but uh, looking at the ways in which people with disabilities get marginalized over and over again and trying to understand the sentiment in the disability rights community that says really what I was saying in answer to a previous question, not only are people with disabilities equal to other people, but also, they have some horrible experiences that nobody would want. They also gain certain kinds of insight that actually people would want. And um, I mean, ultimately I feel like everything I write is about identity and how does your identity strengthen you? And for artists in the Soviet Union, the community that they formed in the face of repression and the ways in which they argued for um, freedom and truth in the face of a regime that was bent on annihilating those very virtues, you know, it became unbelievably a powerful motor for them not only to make great art, but to live really very noble um, and brave lives. And it takes courage to walk the planet being not like everyone else, but almost no one is really like everyone else. And the courage that it takes is partly the courage to live the experience and partly the courage to acknowledge it, at least to yourself and probably and possibly to the other people around you, including in particular your children. You know, there, there's a comment which um, makes me think about this uh, relationship of stepping into one's own identity with courage in a world that deludes itself about there being some sort of uniform, quote, normality. Um, one of our wonderful participants says, I was raised by a single mom. My parents divorced when I was five. It was a hard upbringing for me in the 60s with only a mom. I was an original latchkey kid. Mom worked two jobs and I had to, to be on my own at eight. All my friends were in a family with a father. I was very sad that I wasn't in a typical family. I can imagine what children go through in the different families that we have today. Life can be so tough on children. And that made me think about the, the, the challenge of a world which creates this delusion that families are all supposed to be one way or that we should all be identical in our identities. Well, I think, I think what was true in the 60s is not entirely true in the 2020s. But again, it depends where you are and what community you're part of. And I speak from the um, position, which is in that regard, very privileged of someone who lives in, you know, downtown um, uh, uh, Manhattan, where um, uh, you can get away with anything. Um, and uh, I think the uh, this experience of growing up with a single mother of other people then um, uh, looked at it as a lesser kind of family it must have been extremely uh, painful and extremely difficult. The purpose of what I'm writing and what I'm saying to you right now and the work I do in the world is to try to get us to a point at which those differences are less difficult, are less pronounced, are less severe. Um, that's really what I hope ultimately to be able to do. And maybe I can and maybe I can't. But, um, uh, you know, it's all a matter of degrees. Um, but to make people at ease with the ways in which they're different. Um, and 
the ways in which their family is different. And it's very hard to do if you have a community that resists whatever position you're taking on that subject. That, you know, that, that brings us um, first circle to where you started with regard to, um, I, I think the oppressive experience of LGBTQ families having to take the stance that really it would be very much the same uh, in a way that sort of erased the important differences, some of which might be challenges, many of which are to celebrate. And um, in, in your book, you talk about the ways in which the, um, LGBTQ parents are <clears throat> similar in many ways, their families to heterosexual ones, and also ways that they are different. And uh, uh, you write, new family structures are different from mainstream ones. We are not lesser, but we are not the same. And to deny the nuance of that asymmetry is to keep us as ensnared as we were when our marriages and families were impossible. Acquiescence to historical standards is still commonly recognized as the essence of good parenting, but I'd emphasize the equal power of imaginative breaks with tradition. So gay parents have the right to difference too. The ways my family and I love one another are as radical as they are profound. Love, yeah, your words are so great, Andrew. <laughs> I, just, I mean, they're so, love in italics is a general term only by expanding the collection of specificities it, love encompasses, can we continue to vitalize it? So you, you talk with us about um, the imaginative breaks with tradition and uh, about love in its many different specificities and how we vitalize those. Well, um, I mean, it's a, it's a sort of great project for the culture at large. And we live in a moment, I think, when um, the culture is very divided between people who want to see us continue to progress toward greater openness and acceptance and people who really want to close down the openness and acceptance even that already exists. And I think that the dichotomous nature of the society is revealed in polarization and is due in part to social media and um, is demonstrated by the ways in which the two political parties have such different concerns they're focusing on and uh, certainly is um, you know, very much manifest in the arguments taking place now about whether to overturn Roe v. Wade, which seems likely to happen very shortly. Um, when I was working in Afghanistan, um, I had many profound experiences, but one of the most shocking experiences I had was when I was sitting with someone who was showing me an old family photo album. And there were all these women in miniskirts in Kabul um, uh, walking um, uh, cheerfully down the boulevards. And I thought, it's not that these people who are wearing burqas, that that's just been historically and forever the repressed way that women were treated there. It's something that came in and happened after the liberalization had taken place. So I feel like there is a battle both to increase the number of ways in which people can form families and to broaden our understanding of the word family itself, in which, for example, my mother's best friend was effectively my aunt, but she wasn't really an aunt. And then do you use the word aunt and so on and so forth? I think we have to um, understand that there's a need to protect anything that we have achieved as well as um, to continue to work to move forward. And I feel so lucky. If I had been born 25 years earlier, I would never have had a family. And having um, children has been the great joy of my life. Now, for many years when I was much younger, I kind of tortured myself with the idea that I couldn't have a family unless I could bring myself to marry a woman and suppress the rest of who I was. And because I really, really, really wanted to have kids, I tried to do that. Um, and then I ultimately decided that I couldn't live in a relationship in which I was essentially being dishonest to myself and thereby dishonest to whoever I was with, though I had some lovely girlfriends for a while and they were great. But, uh, but in the end, I think um, we have to be honest about who we are and we have a collective responsibility to try to ensure that 
the movement continues to go forward rather than sliding back. And, and for um, parents specifically, um, in our work at, at the Brown Touchpoint Center, uh, we have this um, major focus on lifting up the wisdom and knowledge and expertise of parents. And uh, you write in, the, in, in your book, uh, to parents, you say, you know less than you think you do. The constant reinforcement of that sorry idea has become a drumbeat under parenting as advice books of every kind pullulate like toadstools after a storm. Such literature sets out to refocus your daily life with your child, usually with proscriptive rebukes and optimistic exercises with easy sounding answers that are often impossible to enact. Anyone who has raised a child will know how assault of the abundance of such parenting advice can feel, how dreary it is to be told constantly that if only you did or indeed had done something slightly different, your child's problems would evanesce. And you would have, through the alchemy of nurture, a child who is happy, well-behaved, nonviolent, good at math, successful, self-motivated, popular, and thin. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, uh, if we go back to um, uh, specificities of love, and imaginative breaks with tradition, are there things that are the same and different for um, LGBTQ parents as they face that drumbeat of parent advice that makes all parents feel like the experts know, but you're not an expert? Well, there is plenty of stuff out there that would argue um, especially that they sort of accept that maybe two women can bring up children all right, but the idea that two men can do so and that you don't need to have um, a mother figure in a child's life, you know, that is still an argument that one is still constantly having, and it's a difficult one to, um, to, uh, to win. Um, in an era in which there is all of this um, endless advice about attachment, parenting, and all of the rest of it. I won't sort of run through it. I think people know how much of it is out there. What I said was, of course, a variation on Dr. Spock's famous opening line of the book that determined what parenting was life in the, like in the 50s, which was, you know more than you think you do. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. feel like gradually that notion, which was very valuable and which was part of why um, his books had such a positive effect on people, though they're now very dated, um, uh, you know, has been pushed aside by a self-help industry that's often a self-interested self-help industry um, focused not so much on ensuring that everything goes really well for your children, but instead focused on um, uh, ensuring that they, uh, that they are brought up in ways that conform um, to a particular set of standards. You know, there's some great advice, and I will admit that when we started with parenting, we didn't know much about it. And I'm actually rather annoyed by the system in which your child is each age only for a year. I mean, my son just turned 13 and I feel like, okay, if he had been 12 for two or three more years, I would have really gotten 12 down and then I would have been ready for 13. But I feel like this thing where every year he's suddenly a year older is, you know, it's challenging. It's really tough. And um, one does look to experts for advice and to see what are the mistakes I could make and what are the ways I could do things. And you know, in a way, though my book won't be a book about how to parent, it will be a book about parenting, and perhaps um, it will be read within that um, within that context. But I think ultimately um, that, uh, you know, and, and then people sort of say, love makes a family, and that's a lovely line, and it's been a great thing to put on sort of buttons you can wear on your lapel, but actually, I think love plus a lot of other things makes a family. Love plus dedication, plus time, plus focus, plus all kinds of other things all go there. Love is the foundation, but there's a lot else that's, um, that's involved. Um, and, you know, different uh, parents have different abilities and vulnerabilities, and so do different children. You know, some of us are lucky and get easy children, and some of us um, are less lucky and get children who are very, very difficult to understand and who um, are holding back in all kinds of profound ways. So that's the, that's the divide. And um, one has to be compassionate um, with people who are struggling. Um, it's hard being a parent and it's especially hard. I mean, we haven't touched on this very much, but I do will in that book and I try to in my work, 
what is hard for parents without means um, and often for parents of color is different from what's hard for those of us who live easier, more comfortable lives. Um, if you are a single mother of three children and have to work two jobs, I mean, that's, as the person who wrote in said, extremely difficult for the child and extremely difficult for that mother who presumably wanted to provide for her family, her child, the best she could. Um, and I think we have to be aware of those difficulties and respond to them with, you know, compassion and welcome rather than say, well, I'm glad I don't live there um, and take it from that point. You know, that's one of the things that I, I mentioned to you earlier, I really appreciated about the manuscript is um, the, the uh, constant awareness of the lenses through which you see, of the perspective from which you see, and of the privileges um, that you have in um, your sensitivity and, and I think, you know, brutal honesty and self-scrutiny with regard to um, what you may not see, what may you may not understand, and you know where the limits are to what you can understand, and, and this sort of is segues to uh, a question we have uh, about the difficulty families might face when they have an intersectionality in their family structure, such as an undocumented same-sex couple or transgender multiracial family. So perhaps you can speak to that before we get to our. Um, our, our last question on your hopes and dreams for the future and call um, to action. Well, I think that the intersectionality complicates things considerably. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, one can have a sense of humor about it. There was someone I interviewed um, when I was in England, where I lived just a little bit at the time. I'm mostly uh, here in New York. But, um, and she said to me, I just thought, I'm already Jewish, I might as well be a lesbian. Um, and it was her attitude that she was already dealing with being different um, in a somewhat anti-Semitic society, um, and she might as well just go for it and be completely different. But there are, you know, there are support groups um, of one kind or another for, and I don't just mean sort of organized online groups or ones where everyone sits in a church basement, but there are support of one kind or another for most of the kinds of difference that I am aware of and that I will chronicle. There are fewer support um, uh, uh, structures for people who represent two uh, of the issues that I've looked at. So, you know, if you've been adopted into a polygamous family and you're dealing with adoption and with polygamy, which is something that I looked at, if you have been, um, uh, if you have been uh, born with assisted reproduction and you're, uh, uh, you're gay, for, for instance, I mean, there are many of these situations and I could catalog a lot of them. The question is, if you are in those situations, what is your identity? And a lot of people seem to think you have to assign yourself to a particular identity and say, well, I'm really mostly gay, but also I'm interracial, or I'm really mostly this, but I'm also that. You have to be, um, in the words of the National LGBTQ Task Force, where I serve on the board, um, all of you all the time. That's um, what we claim to aspire to. And that's what I think people need to aspire to. And therefore, they need recognition of all of the things that are going on with them, rather than to feel, well, I'll talk to the gay support group on Wednesday, and I'll talk to the interracial support group on Thursday, and I'll try to sort of be really gay on Wednesday and really interracial on Thursday. <laughs> Um, that's not a great way to live. Um, if you can integrate your identity into something solid and coherent, that I think is a better way to live. All of you, all of me, all of us, all the time. I just love that. There's something so liberating about um, where you take us to. So for our, our last question, really to sort of listen to your call for action. I wanted to read one last excerpt from your manuscript, Who Rocks the Cradle, in which you so movingly write about the connection you make between being a father who is gay and all of you, and your activism uh, for LGBTQ rights and, and so many other things. You write, I have lived a life that has surprised no one more than me. It has raised legal and ethical issues, but it has also been the downstream product of a fight for liberation 
that has been my deepest mission. Having children creates a new imperative for safety that is unimaginable until they come along, which is to say that if I didn't already have children, I might be fearful of having them. And then I skip to another excerpt that I connect. So when I read to them at night or made up stories after lights out or got deeply involved in their school, it was not only because those activities were fun or meaningful, it was also because I hope they provided an armor for the difficult life into which I had introduced them. And when I got involved in LGBTQ activism, serving for decades on the board of the National LGBTQ Task Force, I did so not only to reassure myself, but also in hopes of making a safe world for them. So in our, our last few minutes together, tell us, uh, what role we can all play in making the world a safer one for your children and for all of our children and all kinds of families? Well, I mean, the answers are ones that have been implied in some of the responses I've already given, but essentially I think it is um, to be welcoming of people who are coming from different experiences and to do so deliberately and consciously. Um, six years ago, um, my husband and I um, uh, took in, and, and George, I suppose, as a family, we took in someone who was a, um, a Libyan refugee um, who had had to flee the country. He was someone I had met very, very briefly when I was in Libya, and he's been living with us for the last six years um, uh, since um, he came here. And I felt it was important to do that not only because he's a nice guy and it would be good for him. Um, but also because I thought it was good for my children to grow up understanding that this is part of what we do. We have advantages, we have privileges, people in other contexts don't have those advantages and privileges. You know, I think it's the same thing that motivates the people who are doing um, a really good work within the foster care system, broken though that system essentially is. And, uh, and I think that it's the it's what we model to our children. It's how we talk to them about these issues. It's when your child comes home and says something that sounds prejudiced, not just saying you really shouldn't say that, but having a conversation about why not to say it and how not to say it. Um, I think it's a matter of, um, of being as richly engaged with the world as you can bear to be and richly engaged on behalf, not only of people like you, but on behalf of the people who are unlike you and not to as much as you can be made uncomfortable by the fact that they are unlike you, you know, to try and say, when something makes you uncomfortable, I'm gonna figure out why it makes me uncomfortable and I'm gonna try not to be uncomfortable anymore rather than saying it makes me uncomfortable and I'm gonna leave the room right now. So I think that's the, the great message really is, um, uh, you know, is not merely tolerance, um, but actually celebration of the variety of human experience. You know, I started out by saying how um, folks would find out how lucky we are to have a, a bit of your time with us. And I'm just thinking about George and little Blaine and um, Hass, uh, and how lucky they are to sort of be around the table with you um, to have these kinds of conversations with you. Thank you so much, Andrew Solomon. Um, I know you've got a lot of books to write at the same time, but we'll all be really eager to read um, the book, uh, Who Rocks the Cradle? Thank you. And um, maybe you'll come back again to um, talk with us about uh, another book you're working on, on um, child suicide. So uh, before we go, I just want to uh, let everyone know we'll be back with another Learning to Listen Conversation for Change with Sesame Workshop on May 11th. And they will be talking with us about the work that they're doing with children who are fleeing war zones, areas of conflict, uh, and helping children and families resettle in communities in the United States. Also on Monday, we will have another episode of our LGBTQIA2 plus families then and now series. That's a six part series. You're welcome to join next Monday for one or all of them. Parenting While Black continues on May 2nd and May 16th. And on April 28th, we have an informational session on our supporting father involvement. And on May 3rd, 
uh, join us for families and recovery touch points in the context of substance use disorder. Thank you all for joining us today. Again, thank you so much, Andrew Solomon, and we hope we'll see you again. Stay well, be safe, see you all soon. Bye-bye.